first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this project of oral narratives of mm -hmm. Latinos in Ohio. Today is Wednesday, August uh, 12th, 2020. Um, can you start um, by giving us your full name, please? Yes, my name is Raimundo Garza. Um, in the United States and Mexico was Raimundo Garza Covarrubias. Okay, great. Uh, so, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Matamoros, Mexico, Mexico, who's a, Matamoros is a border town right across the Texas border from mm -hmm. Brownsville, Texas. Okay. Northeast tip of Mexico type. Right. Uh, tell me about uh, growing up in Matamoros. What was your daily life like? Oh gosh, so it was, um, actually I think back, and in fact I was thinking about it a couple days ago, that it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Despite that, um, it was always, Matamoros is now a very conflicting area, mm -hmm. and it was a conflicting area back then, but the uh, conflicts that we experienced in the community were different than they are today. They were less violent, or the uh, violence that occurred at the time, it was more gears to the people who were in the groups that mm -hmm. belonged to those people that were just fighting for territories, drug cartels, what have you. Mm -hmm. So put that all around our childhood. Mm -hmm. And we grew up in, a, in Matamoros. Uh, at the time when I grew up, it was, we used to go to school by ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we walked sometimes, our parents dropped us off, we walked back to school from school to the house. We pick up the uh, tortillas on the way back mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Los mandados, no? Los mandados. <laughs> the the, the uh, Sundays we used to do El Rol mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and La Colonia Jardín, mm -hmm. which I think is still happens, so I'm not sure if I it don't does. Know. <laughs> um, so it was, a, um, it was a childhood filled with um, a lot of friends close family, uh, grandparents, aunts and uncles, a um, lot of activities. So growing up in a border town, it was interesting because some of your friends, they reside in Mexico and some of the friends also reside in Brownsville, mm -hmm. Texas. So getting across the border, it was a very common thing to do, mm -hmm. even to just go and buy a gallon of milk. And same thing, the friends from Brownsville crossing the border mm -hmm. to Matamoros to buy aguacates mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Right. Um, so we uh, grew up in a, my father was a, uh, owned his own business and since very early on he took us to his business. So since we were kids we started to gain some work ethic mm -hmm. and understanding the um, how hard it is to really earn a living. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate enough that my parents gave us um, a lot of great options um, and we took them, mm -hmm. uh, we leveraged them. Um, right after high school I was, I took uh, part of a, a foreign exchange program and I spent a year or so, yeah a year, less than a year, uh, in Wisconsin. Mm. Um, to date, I'm still friends with the family, which I consider <laughs> them my parents mm -hmm. and my brother, mm -hmm. um, Adam. Um, so that was um, just in a nutshell. It was just filled with great me memories, mm -hmm. um, great food. Mm -hmm. um, some, I don't want to say that everything was happy. Um, there was some um, down times as well. Mm -hmm. um, every time an economic devaluation happened, mm -hmm. I mean, we all just tighten our belts and mm -hmm. stop doing things and mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. So um, so that was just in a nutshell. I mean, there was, I have some pretty nice memories. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have a brother mm -hmm. and I have two sisters. Uh, my brother is older than me, my two sisters are younger. 
and they're still in that area. Mm -hmm. They, uh, except they don't live in Matamoros, they live in Brownsville. Okay. So over time, the migration somehow starts just to take place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're going to get mm -hmm. later on of what, how I migrated to the U.S. Right, but, right. So I'll leave that okay. for later. You, my mother is still there as mm -hmm. well. My mom is one of those uh, persons who refuses to completely give up her space in Mexico mm -hmm. and goes back and forth. Right. And Mount that's very common. You're bringing up something. I mean, I'm familiar with our area because we both grew up in Matamoros, Mexico. Yes. Um, but um, I like your description of this fluidity of the border, right? People coming yes. back and forth all the time, yes. being normal. Um, and part of that experience, right, of living in the border, you just go wherever you need to go to get the product that you need to or the service yes. that you need to. Yep. Um, and this is very common there. So this is something that actually since we were um, kids, my mother in particular, she was an activist. She's always been an activist. And so I learned a lot from my mother um, and friends and other relatives. And, um, but the border, the dynamics of the border is like a third um, country that is happens between the United States and Mexico. Mm -hmm. So the behaviors and the customs that we have in that area are not understood by the laws and regulations that are that are put in place by both countries, mm -hmm. both Mexico and the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's not such a thing as a clear divide. Right. There is a whole situation going on in those two areas. So create some interesting dynamic it creates um, dynamics that are not easy to manage. Mm -hmm and that they create a lot of conflicts as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just thinking about um, the fact that it's very likely that you have family members living in both places, right? Yes. And yeah. to... Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. Um, growing up, you said you, you had um, brothers and sisters. Did you ever have to take care of your siblings or help around the house in that way uh, with, with your younger sisters or anything like that? Um, the, I mean, we looked at after each other, mm -hmm. um, we, so my, my oldest sister and my brother and I were somehow close together, so then we had a sister that was a lot younger, so from taking, taking care of my sister from, um, economic perspective, never. It was not the need mm -hmm. or anything, or my siblings, mm -hmm. but there was the, um, we protect each other all mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. and there was a, a more particular protection for my younger sister, mm -hmm. obviously, because she was a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my parents, I think, were more care, care free with her, mm -hmm. because they had the experience of us growing up <laughs> already, so they mm -hmm. knew what was happening, but then we started to grow up and just, we start seeing that they need us mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's to the extent of how we grew up and how we took care of each other. What memories do you have of the four of you as siblings growing up and what kind of things did you do together? Um, yes. Did you live in a place where you could uh, play outside or do things, you know, there's a lot of outdoor space for you to Yeah, be. so we, um, we had some extracurricular activities. Um, all of us did different things. Um, my brother was more involved in sports. I was more involved in the arts, mm -hmm. as you can see, <laughs> some of those things that I um, still do. Um, terms of I used to go to painting classes and um, art classes. Um, my sisters, they have different activities as well. Together growing up, I mean, some of the uh, precious memories that I have is when we used to travel together with my parents mm -hmm. that uh, my dad had a Volkswagen Volkswagen uh, mm -hmm. van, mm -hmm. una combi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we all jump in that car just tour Mexico. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We went for a month, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the uh, just the the moments, the experiences of getting to new places and going into these restaurants. Back then, there wasn't such a thing as Expedia that you <laughs> do uh, reservations in advance. Yeah. I remember my parents stopping in every hotel or motel just to inquire if there was vacancy. Right. And they would go and check out the rooms and they give the okay or not, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I don't think that happens in this day and age <laughs> with so much technology around us. And so. Um, we we went to the same school, um, La Salle, mm -hmm. uh, most of our time. I think my sisters went to, my older sister went to uh, Don Bosco, which is another school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but then she incorporated, the La Salle became co-ed, so she, she came and joined us. Um, so we, the three, four of us, when my sister, little sister, came and started to grow up, so we all commute to school together mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, we did our friends and families. Uh, they had kids from different ages, mm -hmm. like our ages as well. So we grew up together mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And my parents were friends with their parents and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's a very, it was a very tight knit uh, mm -hmm. culture community. So Matamoros is a is a is a coast. It's a it, it, it has the beaches, right? Yes. Do you remember going to to those places too? To oh. either like the beaches in Matamoros, or in um, the island South Padre Island. Both. <laughs> Both. Actually, yes. Uh, we used to take when we were um, very young. We used to take Sundays and go to the beach in Matamoros, mm -hmm. Playa La mm -hmm. It was a whole camping day. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was a lot of fun, just doing everything that you do at the beach. The thing that I disliked the most was watch the car at the end of the yeah. day. <laughs> I just sure. wanted to get home. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we had to make these big lines and these car wash um, places yeah. to wash the car. Right, because uh, the the beach in Matamoros, you drive to. On the beach, you like drive, it's, yeah. it's not you're, a parking lot. Right? That's right. So a, you go through the sand and mm -hmm. it just gets really messy. Mm -hmm. And then, also when we were kids, we um, we started going to South Padre Island, and this is back then where there was absolutely no development in South Padre Island. Mm -hmm. It was just Isla Blanca Park, which mm -hmm. is at the end of the of the island, and the uh, we. My parents used to rent a uh, little trailer home, mm -hmm. but it was there to some senior people or people that had it. They right. rented away. This, this is the Airbnb of 40 <laughs> years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, so we spent a whole month in there, mm -hmm. the island. Mm -hmm. I think we did it only like two or three times, not, not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, there was, the development started to occur, and we uh, my parents used to uh, rent a week-long condo mm -hmm. at the island. Mm -hmm. And we had friends and family from Mexico just came over for one day and spent time with them, mm -hmm. went to the pool, went to the beach, yeah. ate so much great food, <laughs> lots of watermelon. Right, right. <laughs> so great. I think you can relate to that. Yes, very <laughs> much, very much. Yes. Um, what did your parents do? And yeah, so my, my dad was a business owner, he passed away, um, so he started um, a, back then, through my grandfather, so they started an electronics business, um, and radio and TV, and my dad's business evolved into telecommunications, so that's how he built his uh, he continued on and built his business before he passed away. Mm -hmm. My brother took care of the business. Mm -hmm. um, economic circumstances, what have you, a lot of the drug cartel conflicts mm -hmm. impacted a lot of the economy in the business and the local businesses, so they got impacted. My brother ended up uh, shutting down the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's in Brownsville now. Okay. 
What about your mom? My mother, um, she's first and foremost, she's an activist. She's mm -hmm. always been, mm -hmm. um, but she's been a housewife, but also very strongly involved in the arts mm -hmm. um, in Matamoros. Um, she, when we were kids, she, she went to school for nutrition, mm -hmm. and she worked at a hospital as a the nutritionist mm -hmm. of the hospital in Matamoros. Mm -hmm. But not for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, what traditions um, do you remember your parents keeping while you were there? You know, and I'm asking this question because now you're here in in, in Ohio. Yes. And so, what what traditions do you remember practicing or or keeping with your family when you were in Matamoros? Oh, there are so many. Mm -hmm. um, so, obviously, um, the Easter holiday, mm -hmm. the, more so than the religious aspect of that, which to me really wasn't very important, the mm -hmm. religious aspect, <laughs> but the fact that we all dressed up and had a really nice, go to a really nice place mm -hmm. to have food mm -hmm. uh, and just be together. Mm -hmm. So that was a non-negotiable uh, event right. if we wanted to get out or bailed out that was not negotiable <laughs> so that was a very consistent mm -hmm. um, and, and straight way let's mm -hmm. put it that way mm -hmm. just that's what we're going to do mm -hmm. um, around the Christmas holiday so obviously it started with the uh, posadas Mm -hmm. I think, which is my birthday, mm -hmm. December 16th, <laughs> so we always started with my birthday and we continue on through the Christmas day, mm -hmm. um, New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, all the way to uh, Dia de los Reyes, mm -hmm. La Rosca de Reyes, mm -hmm. so that, those traditions were very much ingrained um, in my family, mm -hmm. there still are. Um, Obviously, also in November, El Dia de Muertos. Mm -hmm. So since my dad passed away, my mom still, today, she does an altar for my mm -hmm. dad for Dia de Muertos. Mm -hmm. Do you keep that tradition here in, in Ohio? I have not kept it here, uh -huh. but every time my mom comes here and visits, we do something that is very... Mm -hmm. We go to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And mom, you're gonna cook for us today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> she makes the best in tomatadas. Oh my goodness. Me está dando hambre. So I know that there is also uh, charro days there yes. on the border. Did yes. you participate on that? Do you remember doing? Um, yeah. So well, I remember attending the um, the uh, parades and uh -huh. the festivities. Um, I was never part of the parades because mm -hmm. I was an spectator, mm -hmm. but my sisters mm -hmm. and my mom and everybody else were on the parade, mm -hmm. dressing mm -hmm. up, crossing the border. For right. It started in Matamoros right. and ended up in Brownsville. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those traditions that is in one area. I'm not sure if it still takes place in such a way know. where yeah. it crosses the border. Yeah, I remember that too, like yeah. going back and forth. So another way to, you know, think about the border in, in, in a very fluid way where you yes. have a celebration that connects the both It cities. connects both cities, that mm -hmm. is correct. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. what we did back then. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, what languages do you speak? Speaks Espanol mm -hmm. and I speak um, English. Okay. Um, try to learn another language, but I never got far enough. <laughs> Do you get to use Spanish a lot in your in your life uh, here in, um, in Ohio? Yeah, so I speak with my neighbors, um, with my neighbor, um, mm -hmm. Cami. Um, we speak in Spanish when she and I are together. For the most part, we talk Spanish. Um, at work, mm -hmm. uh, part of my job and responsibility is to serve the uh, the Mexico team. We mm -hmm. have a sales team for the organization that I work. Okay. So I deal with them and mm -hmm. I talk to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not in sales, but I'm from a human resources aspect. Mm -hmm. I deal a lot with them. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, every time that I talk with my family, mm -hmm. FaceTime, 
saying mm -hmm. Spanish. Every time that I sometimes on on Facebook when I want to make a point to my uh, Mexico friends and family, I write it in Spanish <laughs> on my wall, right, <laughs> on right. my timeline. So right. Um, have you ever had any um, maybe bad experiences using Spanish in public here in, in Ohio? Um, I have, let me put it this way, no one has called me out. There's no Spanish. Um, I have Obviously, I have had the experience of people arguing that Spanish should be, it's not the official language. Mm -hmm. um, but I have not been personally confronted about that mm -hmm. yet. Do you, ever, do you feel comfortable using the language in any time you want to use it? Yes, yeah, so if, if, I'm, if I'm with a Spanish-speaking person, mm -hmm. I prefer to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I go to the Mexican market. There, we have a Mexican market in, the, um, in Lakewood, which is the next neighborhood next to Cleveland. Um, and all the personnel, everyone that works in there, there are people from Mexico for the most part, mm -hmm. uh, are Spanish speaking. So mm -hmm. uh, there is no hesitation in right. speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. They speak Spanish from the get go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you check it out, the it's tall, señor. Algo más. Sí, sí. <laughs> so yes, and I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? So um, I mean, Spanish, Spanish, speaking Spanish is part of you. Yes. Uh, what phrases do you find yourself sort of using often in Spanish, or maybe when you talk to to your family? Uh -huh. What What are some of those? I don't know, this might take a minute for you to think, oh, what yeah. is it that I use all the time? So there's a, so my grandmother, so let me go back to that. My <laughs> grandmother was, um, she used a lot of these um, phrases. Dichos, no? Dichos. Dichos. <laughs> yeah. That, honestly, I cannot even think of one, but when it comes, when it, there's the opportunity, and when I'm talking with someone, it just comes up. It comes up, yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how how he how it's used mm -hmm. for very appropriate situations mm -hmm. or circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so but obviously when I'm talking with my brothers or sisters, with my sisters is Hola, ¿cómo estás? Mm -hmm. ¿Qué onda? ¿Qué onda? Yeah, that's very Mexican. <laughs> yes. ¿Qué onda? ¿Qué for pasa? Sure. <laughs> Ay, qué padre. Mm -hmm. So that's super cool. All right, all right. Um, so those are, I mean, those are part of the colloquial language that mm -hmm. we use mm -hmm. in Mexico. Or the, when that part of the the uh, region in Mexico, not the most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there we go, Keith and I, we go to uh, travel to Mexico quite a bit. Mexico, we've been to Mexico City, Guanajuato, San Miguel, Oaxaca. Riviera Maya, mm -hmm. um, Puerto Vallarta, and a few other places, and um, and the Spanish in those areas is obviously is Mexican Spanish, but there is the accents are different. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. the uh, it seems to be more cordial mm -hmm. the way that pe people refer <laughs> to you or talk to you. Mm -hmm than the way we do it in the in Norte. El norte. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we have a reputation of like screaming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Raimundo, um, how do you identify? Uh, well, I'm a guy who is married to a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm a gay man. Okay. Um, how was um, your experience growing up in Matamoros, Mexico, as as a gay man? Yes. Yeah, so there was um, so there was a topic that it was not talked about. It was a topic. I went to a Catholic school, so every time that I heard from our teachers, our 
mentors mm -hmm. that that's something that is not well accepted mm -hmm. and my school peers making fun of not me but just the situations mm -hmm. that if someone had was a feminine or what have you so there was no respect um, it's something that in the culture is not in Mexico just in general it's uh, not still not well accepted mm -hmm. in my opinion I haven't been there almost 20 years mm -hmm. I know there's been a lot of progress towards that um, in fact there is there's marriage that is legal in some states in Mexico, mm -hmm. not throughout Mexico. So, uh, so this is the reason that I want you to ask this question because I think that was one of the strongest motivators mm -hmm. for me to take this next life step mm -hmm. in the U.S. to come to the U.S. and it happened to be as an opportunity, job opportunity. And I did not hesitate in one bit mm -hmm. to come and mm -hmm. just be in a, in a place where I was going to be safer, mm -hmm. where I was going to be able to live my life the mm -hmm. way I wanted. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> Were you able at all to live as a, as a gay man in Matamoros with, just with your family or with your friends? Yeah, and... just a little bit, but mm -hmm. it was not talked, mm -hmm. talked about. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, this past weekend, and I think it's not only in Mexico, it happens in the U.S. This past weekend, a, a, we were with some friends and some of their friends, some of their family members say that uh, they just don't talk about their his ne nieces or nephews' life because they suspect that mm -hmm. he or she is, a, is gay. Mm -hmm. and but it's not talked about. Mm -hmm. So that, sort of like that comment related back to back when I was growing up that everyone suspects but it's not addressed it's not talked about. Talk about. Mm -hmm. So when there is not a, when there is nothing open or when the door is not even slightly open to have a conversation just shut down. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did for the most part. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm open on Facebook, I'm open everywhere. So mm -hmm. we got married, we got married in Mexico. <laughs> wow, great. Yes. Um, so what year did you first come to, to Ohio? And did you move directly to Cleveland? Yes, so I only lived in Cleveland. So I came here in 2000. I started coming here in the year 2000 and I accepted for a project. Mm -hmm. At the end of the project, uh, my boss, who happens to be a great friend now, and it was then as well. Uh, in fact, I still work with her mm -hmm. uh, 20 years later, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, she offered me a job to stay in Ohio, mm -hmm. and that's why the personal situation that I wanted to live my life the way I wanted mm -hmm. and this was a great opportunity for me to do so. Mm -hmm. So I went through all the mechanics of going through all these different types of visas, getting <laughs> your passport stamped at the consulates mm -hmm. and renovation of visas again and then I went through uh, the whole permanent residency process. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I went through the citizenship process. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been rewarding, <laughs> very rewarding. Great. What were your um, what your first impressions? Uh, some of your first memories of moving here to Ohio, a very different place than Matamoros, Mexico. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is this is what strikes, and I tell the story all the time. Um, <laughs> first off. Um, the the weather was something that was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So growing up in northern Mexico, there's an eternal summer. There's not such thing as four seasons. It's either hot or hotter, right? Yes, mm -hmm. hot or hotter. <laughs> and here, the fact that we had the different seasons throughout the year, mm -hmm. I think it was so great. Um, and I even have these conversations with my mother and say, 
Mom, I think the fact that we have that, or that we live through that, makes us more appreciative of what we have mm -hmm. and the environment and your abilities to do or not do things mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, but that was not the uh, that was not my answer. My answer was <laughs> first the biggest change to me was being able to operate and speak English mm -hmm. all day long. Mm -hmm. So I was accustomed to think and speak Spanish mm -hmm. for eight hours or twenty four hours a day or mm -hmm. whatever time was awake on a given day. So then I started to go to work to go to work and I have to speak English and mm -hmm. I have to communicate in English. Mm -hmm. I have to write English. Mm -hmm. I have to think in English. I have to dialogue and debate in English. Mm -hmm. I clearly remember after the work day, five o'clock We'll go to my place, <laughs> have dinner, take a shower, and go to bed. It was exhausting. It was exhausting. <laughs> I was mentally exhausted mm -hmm. for weeks and weeks and weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. And it, until I just got accustomed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that, was, uh, that I first started to shape, the way I pronounced my name and last name in Spanish, mm -hmm. I was pronouncing it that way when I moved here, mm -hmm. and I had to repeat it like three or four times all the time. Mm -hmm. So I started to adjust the way I pronounced my name and last name, mm -hmm. so people started to understand what I was saying, mm -hmm. and I did. And to date, I do it. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying Raimundo Garza, I say Raimundo Garza. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds easier. <laughs> yeah, sounds at the same level of the English pronunciation, mm -hmm. despite that is a foreign name and last name. So. Right, right. <laughs> so that was that was uh, some of the learnings that I that I had at the beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, it might have been just me. <laughs> it's different for everybody. So. Right. Um, aside from the language, uh, what other uh, things do you remember that were maybe that took some time or maybe it was a struggle to adjust to um, when you first came here? Um, Did you find community quickly? Um, it took me, I guess that's a great question. It took me, one of the things, the way I found community, I used my, I guess my Mexican, culture as the means, not necessarily the culture itself, but my, the behavior mm -hmm. of my culture mm -hmm. as a means to find community. Mm -hmm. So every time I will, back then, every time that I will meet someone, I will invite them to the house mm -hmm. and for a meal mm -hmm. and drinks. Mm -hmm. And that's how I never hesitated in opening my house. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a, that was the way, that's the way we do it in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, I think that's what, that's how I was able to do it. I still do it. We still do it. Um, but I think back then was more deliberate because I didn't want to be alone. Mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. to find community. I wanted to find relationships, right. which today I have, we have together, mm -hmm. and we've been able to build a really nice group of friends and family acquaintances. And there's people that I've met since back then, mm -hmm. since when I first moved, mm -hmm. that I'm still close with. Um, the um, things that it drove me crazy back then, that here in Ohio, we have to plan things so way in advance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So in Matamoros, I mean, someone right now knocking the door, just stopping by because mm -hmm. they're in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and the mesa, the table is ready for lunch, coming in, and let's mm -hmm. have lunch mm -hmm. together. So that's pretty common in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that in here. Right. Invitar a alguien al café, no? Like you mentioned, like, having people over, even if it's just for café and pan dulce, that's very You common. have to plan it. Yeah, well, here, yeah. <laughs> yes, here you have to plan it. Way in advance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, when you say it's not tomorrow, it's 
two weeks out or next week. <laughs> <laughs> However, with this uh, pandemic situation, um, believe it or not, uh, we've been able to connect with friends mm -hmm. to slowly get reacquainted or reintegrated. Mm -hmm. So we go up to the roof deck and we stay outside. Oh, nice. um, and we find it out that friends, no one has plans. No. <laughs> Everyone's available. So we've been able to plan things like from one day to the next. Right. Because everyone's available. And everyone is eager and seeking mm -hmm. those connections right. and relationships. Right, so. right. Yes, that, that is very true. Um, are you um, involved uh, with the Latino community here in Cleveland? Um, I am not in, I'm not involved. I am familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, I I haven't found the I haven't found the need and let, let me explain the reason why um, is because my customs values and what I find that is me as a man who was born in Mexico, I can be myself with anyone else that I have been able to meet. Mm. I've been able to, I mean, or even establish a conversation mm -hmm. or even education mm -hmm. about the culture. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way we do things in Mexico. Like we had a, we went to a, this past weekend we went to, um, um, Kelly's Island to visit some friends and we brought tamales. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the fact of just opening up all the tamales out there and then all the salsas and what mm -hmm. have you. So educating everyone about how to consume this mm -hmm. dish, which is mm -hmm. delicious. Yes. So that's um, very fulfill fulfilling to me mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that with everyone that I know Mm -hmm. That's why I feel that my needs to seek a specific community to do it or be able to do it, I feel that it's well accepted within the groups that I've been able to establish mm -hmm. that relationship with or relationships. Right. So you mentioned the pandemic and how everybody doesn't have plans. Yes. <laughs> So we are in the summer 2020 and we, we, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, and I, want, I just have some questions about this experiences for you. Yes. Um, how did you find out or how did you get information about coronavirus and just the pandemic in general? So, so we started, obviously we started tracking this when it was in, uh, in China when it started. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing that Keith and I talked about, then we should get some masks, because mm -hmm. who knows? Mm -hmm. So we went to Home Depot, Home Depot. there was mm -hmm. plenty of masks, and 95 masks, mm -hmm. and we bought a few, one for us and one for each member of our families that are here, that mm -hmm. here in Ohio. So time went by, uh, we went to, uh, we took a trip to Florida, Things were okay. I mean, we were we were out. We went to restaurants. This was in January. Uh, then in February, no, this was in February. I'm sorry. Then in March, we went to Mexico. Mm -hmm. We went to Rivera Maya for a few days, and that's when things started to get a little bad. And we came back from Rivera Maya on March 14th. Mm -hmm. So the next Monday, everything was shut down. So we always were close to it, following it, uh, but we weren't expecting that it was going to be that drastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right. Um, what um, what worries you the most right now about this situation? Obviously, the the communities down south. Matamoros, Brazil, mm -hmm. they're being highly impacted right. by it, to mm -hmm. a great extent. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's 
thing that it worries me that is the behavior that we're used to in those communities in Mexico, in Latin America. We're a very close, tight-knit um, individual, mm -hmm. so the social distance <laughs> mm -hmm. concept is so foreign and mm -hmm. it's abstract mm -hmm. in a way. So in, a, in order to shape that behavior, uh, unfortunately it's going to take a lot of lives. Mm. So that's what it worries me the most. Mm. That, um, I have friends in Mexico that they're so drastic and so opinionated about the fact, about the situation. And some of them say, okay, there's too many of us in this war, mm -hmm. so maybe this is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But you say that until it happens to someone that is close to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But equally, not only worried about Mexico, I'm worried about here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've been working from home since March, mm -hmm. and it's been pretty much a... I'm in a fatigue type mm -hmm. mental state mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. That um, not only me, I think a lot of us are. So that's, I just want this to be over. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's going to be over anytime soon. Right. What activities do you do to try to manage some of that maybe fatigue or, you know, having to always be socially distanced, you know, not, not doing the activities that you were used to, maybe socially and professionally. Yeah, no, um, so, yeah, correct. So, uh, socially, we gather. Actually, yesterday we had a gathering down in the, uh, down in the driveway. Mm -hmm. All the neighbors, social distance. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, that's what we do. Um, exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I've been photographing, creating art. Um, or reading, mm -hmm. a lot of information on the news, mm -hmm. following the metrics of all the virus mm -hmm. and how things are evolving and progressing. Uh, that's what thing. So it just it just created a. I mean, we don't even go to the store. Mm -hmm. We order our groceries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a once a week delivery that we set up, and we just want to stay away as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Do you feel that, um, um, and, and you work maybe with a few different communities from work and maybe personally too, um, do you feel like the government has handled this situation um, in a way that is equitable across communities, especially maybe the immigrant community um, or any other marginalized group um, that you might be familiar with here in, in the state or in the city, in, in Cleveland, for example? Yeah, so um, there is, I, I, and I got to speak from a state of Ohio standpoint. Mm -hmm. I disagree with a lot of the things that are happening at the national level, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but from the state of Ohio and the company that I work for and the leadership of our company. Uh, we have taken this to a very, into a very serious situation mm -hmm. and protecting the safety of our employees and ours as families as well has been the number one priority. Um, from a, I haven't had exposure, or I've, let me put it this way, I've seen it from a distance how the aspect of simply just wearing a mask mm -hmm. does not resonate with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is upsetting. Right. Um, so speaking from a government, from a state of Ohio standpoint, I think all the guidelines and uh, regulations and recommendations have been put forth mm -hmm. and it's up to us and mm -hmm. it takes two Right. to really follow those. Um, my neighbor, she works at, um, in fact, I, she's my uh, pulse for the COVID-19 situation mm -hmm. because she works in a COVID-19 hospital here mm -hmm. in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And she, a few weeks ago, uh, she said that they had 55 beds. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I asked her, so how's the COVID status? 
and she said that they're down to 35 beds. Mm -hmm. So it's gone down. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the age range is changing, mm -hmm. shifting. Mm -hmm. It's um, 20s and 40s. Younger people, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, uh, it's the behavior mm -hmm. that's what's driving that. Mm -hmm. um, over the weekend, we were in the uh, Kelly's Island area, and we saw some issues with social distance. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. just withdraw ourselves from those right. situations. And that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that the they've been people has been neglected. It's just people is neglecting the recommendations, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. As far as actual care, I'm not. I don't have information around that on mm -hmm. hospitals and right. that sort of thing. So I can um, comment. Right. Uh, so you mentioned some of the sort of. Uh, the times of getting adjusted to living here in, in, in Ohio, the language and sort of building community and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you've been here for 20 years now, right? Yeah. Um, what is the proudest moment of your life so far of living here? <laughs> oh, what's the proudest? That's a great question. <laughs> so I think one of the, uh, the proudest moments is that I was able to find, and it would have been here or anywhere else, a fantastic life partner. Mm -hmm. And being able to build a life together and always talking about the future, planning about the future, that has led us to really progress mm -hmm. where we are today and where we want to be in the future mm -hmm. as well. Which the future sounds like Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not very soon, but that might be a next step. Okay. So we don't know yet. Yeah. So that's one of the, the proudest moments. The other, the other, that's on the personal life. On the prof professional life, um, I, my job in human resources is to um, scout recruit and develop talent mm -hmm. and I've I've been fortunate enough to have under my responsibility and leadership the creation from ground zero to um, wherever they are those programs at to uh, source talent from multicultural backgrounds mm -hmm. to be brought to Ohio mm -hmm. to develop their engineering career or technical careers mm -hmm. in different fields. Um, actually, we had a, at the time, we had a, a co-op program, which you are familiar probably with a co-op program mm -hmm. is, and we went and recruited to schools in Mexico, mm -hmm. and we brought those co-ops to have their stints here in, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them went back to Mexico, some of them are still here. Mm. And they started their careers. So I was able, I feel proud that I was able to be the conduit for all these different individuals mm. to potentially do a life change like I did, I did back then. Mm -hmm. So they had an option. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very proud of that mm -hmm. and I think it's, uh, that's one of the highlights in my professional life. Mm -hmm. yep. So you've been here um, 20 years. What changes have you witnessed over this you know, past two decades? Um, it could be Ohio in general or just your community here, Cleveland. What, yeah. what have you witnessed? Yes, yeah, so um, the uh, community here at the west side, um, when I first moved here and I started looking to buy a house. Some of my work colleagues were influencing me not to leave in the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. They were influencing me to, if you're gonna buy a house, you wanna buy it in a suburb where mm -hmm. there's a nice school and this and that. And I fell in love with Cleveland, mm -hmm. the West Side. Actually, I used to live the exact amount of time that I that we have from this house to the Westside Market 
I had it from my previous house to the West Side Market. <laughs> um, it was an old house, 1890, no, 1898, yes, it was built. Uh, the day I moved in into that house, I saw change happening every single day. Hmm. And I mean, you, your comments when you first came here, mm -hmm. this is so nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's progressing towards the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, our community has evolved in a way that uh, valuing urban living mm -hmm. is something that is very important. For growth and development. Um, I feel when we were kids in Matamoros, mm -hmm. we used to walk to our two or three blocks, las banquetas, mm -hmm. and until you saw danger, you turn around mm -hmm. and you came back home, mm -hmm. right? So I was talking with a lady from um, Lakewood, and Lakewood is a community where they have sidewalks, mm -hmm. And she, she made a comment about that. I hadn't even related my story about Mexico, but she made a comment that uh, kids grow out to be independent in neighborhoods where there are sidewalks mm -hmm. because they know how to manage themselves more effectively when there is no sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Right. So that happened to us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I was growing up in Matamoros. Mm -hmm. And Matamoros didn't take too many blocks to get out of your house to mm -hmm. really spot danger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you turn around. <laughs> yeah, that's a great that's a great reflection about sidewalks. Yeah. I've always missed that about you know, a lot of neighborhoods in the US don't have they don't sidewalks. Have sidewalks. <laughs> that's right. And I'm like how do people get to places? Um, but they have a purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. And growing up families and mm -hmm. kids. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, Raimundo, what does Ohio mean to you? It's home. Mm -hmm. Right now it's home. Um, we, in fact, we were, Keith and I, we've been talking if we ever move out of Ohio, we want to keep the place here. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, one would think that we will make, like, the places where we grew up, um, like in Mexico that you want to make it an anchor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case for me. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the case will be to make this area an anchor because mm -hmm. this, this uh, 20 years is mm -hmm. a very extensive time of my life. Mm -hmm. And I had so many great, I have so many great memories mm -hmm. here. So we're still thinking about that. Mm -hmm. not sure <laughs> if we, ever want to do that uh, or we may not want to leave Ohio at all. Right. So right. It's just getting too cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned, um, so you are, you work with in the HR field, yes. but you also are an art collector <laughs> yes. and a photographer. Can yes. you talk a little bit um, to us about that? And I know... Um, yeah, so this, this piece is from my sister actually. Mm -hmm. She is a she teaches art in Brownsville, Texas, mm -hmm. and she went to school in Guanajuato, and she made that piece many, many years ago. Uh, this is a U.S. artist. Keith bought that in an auction here mm -hmm. in the, for the, uh, one of the museums. Uh, those two photographs are mine. I did that back on the film days. Mm -hmm many, many years ago. Actually, this is shot, believe it or not, in La Playa Laura Villar. Mm. And who's that woman? Is it someone So, who yeah, so this is the niece of a family friend. Uh -huh. uh, this woman here is my mother. Uh, this are, this other photograph is also mine. And it was just a study, an abstract study that I was doing, um, studying light and form. Mm -hmm. So I really liked that, and I ended up there. In there. Um, this is an artist from Matamoros, Julio Castillo. I'm not sure if he's from Matamoros originally, but that's where I met him. Um, this, um, this other artist is another, is my sister's 
uh, friend from college who's also an artist, and I just learned from her. She was here last year, a year ago, um, and this kid uh, passed away. I don't know what happened to him. And this is an artist from Matamoros, Humberto Jimenez. He's very involved in the community as well, same as this. Um, this is another artist from um, Guanajuato. And this piece, those two photographs are mine, two still lives. They're Polaroids <laughs> from a view camera. Just one of those cameras that you put your hand right mm -hmm. behind it. So that's the piece in here. That piece in there is from an artist from Matamoros as well, um, Joaquin Garcia Quintana. And that's a, actually that's an abstract. And this the, he does a lot of um, art that simulates the border. So the idea of that is the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, mm. the two points of collision and all the chaos hmm. that happens between those two points. Mm -hmm. So if you, mm -hmm. once you explain that piece, it kind of makes sense that you can probably can understand that. Right, right. right. So there's a lot of blot in there, a lot of red. <laughs> <laughs> so what, you said you're a photographer, so what kind of uh, photography do you, do you do, do you like to do? Yes, um, so one, one of the things that I've been doing um, Lately is uh, headshots mm, mm -hmm. for professional headshots mm -hmm. for the most part. But I've been I've done editorial advertising, um, editorial magazine work. Um, the only thing that I haven't done is weddings and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Okay. So that's okay. more on the artistic side. Great. Is that does that feed your your artistic side? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I, it's. It, it's just incredible to... So when I do a headshot, there's two things that get satisfied. Um, number one, the communication and the coaching mm -hmm. with my subject and uh, the lighting mm -hmm. of creating that piece. So mm -hmm. I see every single um, project that steps into this for me that they hire me for mm -hmm. as, a, as a piece that they're going to have, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. going to be very proud of. Right, right. So that's how I see it. Great. It's not just a picture. Yeah. It's yes. your personal brand is mm -hmm. the way you're going to mm -hmm. portray yourself and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. so it's more deeper. Great. Do you have another painting that... Yeah. This is my mother, actually. She came and spent some time mm. with me in Ohio years ago and uh, she painted that she made that piece, so she made that, uh, and she made those two other pieces in there mm -hmm. that you can see. Great. So you can cut those, so you can see. So there are sandias, <laughs> so you can see the watermelons. Yeah. And same as some the previous one. Um, that piece is another artist, and you can see all my photo <laughs> set up. Lightings. And they're there, I put them away. I usually build a studio here. So that's another artist from Patronos, Fernandez. The Sol y la Luna. Mm. That's great that you're supporting people from our hometown. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from college in Matamoros, in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, I had a, I started a business and I had a frame shop. So I would frame mm -hmm. art for all these artists right. who are not pretty well known mm -hmm. or doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. But back then we were really young and right. they needed and I loved their pieces. So we, sometimes we just traded. Oh, that's perfect. Art that's for perfect. frames. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was many, many years ago. Right. Or 30 years ago. <laughs> Mm -hmm. okay. So um, that's that's another piece in there, and there's some more downstairs. Okay. Well, Raimundo, um, thank you so much for this interview. Is there anything else that you would like to add to your story? Um, 
I just want to say thank you. And I, I think just talking through this, it just helps me reflect and appreciate mm -hmm. more and more what uh, my experience has been here in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And which is great. I mean, it's, it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.